Where are you? Last week we talked about where we are. But anytime we talk about where we are, we have to talk about how we got to where we are. There's always a backstory. There's always a sidebar. There's always what we did in order to get where we are. Many of us would like to stick our head in the sand about our past. Many of us would look at that and say, you know, there's a lot of things that I have done that I have done wrong to put me where I am. A financial advisor would say, if you cannot plan for your future, you'll never be ready for retirement. So sometimes we prepare for our future financially, but we've never prepared for our future spiritually. We think more important about how much money we have in the bank than we do about what God is doing within our lives. So when we think about where we are, we have to look about where we went, where we've been. We have to think about what we have done. Joshua was getting ready to cross over the Jordan. And he's told his men, he said, when the Levites put their feet in the water and they're carrying the ark of God, stand back a few thousand feet because where you're going to go, you've never been before. You've never done this before. So when they crossed over, the entire country crossed over the Jordan. Then God told Joshua, he said, here's what I need you to do. I need you to take a stone, one man out of every tribe, and put this stone on his shoulder. And when you cross over the Jordan, I want you to make a memorial for me that your kids and your grandkids will know what God has done today. Sometimes we have to make a stone within our heart. We have to make a memorial unto God. Sometimes we forget what God has done. We could talk about where we've been. Yeah, but I, I don't really remember what took place five years ago or ten years ago. I really don't know why I am here. I believe there's times in our life that we have to put into our hearts. This is what God did within my life. I am here because God did this. The greatest thing that we can do is say, God, I want to honor you in my present. So I have to remember what you've done in my past. One of the things that we can do is say, this day, I remember what day it was that I gave my life to Christ. I remember what God was doing within my life when he changed the direction of my life. There's this quote here from George Santana said this, Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Those that are remembering the past are condemned to repeat it. Or you could say those. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to live without imagining a great future. Sometimes we have to remember where we've been in order for us to understand what's going on today. What have we done? Why are we here? And I believe God has put us here for a reason. You know, I could talk to you all day about things, troubles, pasts. You could stand up here and you can give your testimony and you could talk about things that have happened in your life that has been horrific, that God has had to come to your rescue, and you can say, thank God for the rescue. But in the midst of that turbulent time, you can plead with God but you do not sometimes see God. Sometimes we say, where is God? Why am I going through this? What's going on in my life? And you can look at that and you say, I think this is a desperate time. You don't seem to feel. You don't seem to experience what we really need to experience. And then you say, how do I get here? How did I get to this point? You know, next week we're going to talk about where do I go from here. What, where do I go after I get to this point? Sometimes we have to take a step back before we can see the hand of God move within our life. In this scripture that Brennan just read in Luke chapter 5, if you could point these out, but there are five attributes of God in these 11 verses. Five attributes. Five capsules that God exists in these few verses. And then after I want to share with you what these five capsules truly are, then I want to talk about what God wants to do within your life. He wants to put you here because where you have been. 
You have to ask God to forgive what you have done. You have to put God and say, God, I know that today is a day that you changed my life. We have to have that in our hearts, within our lives. The first attribute of God found in this verse is in verse 1. So it was as they were, the multitudes pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. We think about the word. We think Jesus was sitting. Okay, let, let's give you a little backstory. In, in Luke chapter 4, he was healing people, casting out demons, and he had a gigantic following. I mean, a massive following. Thousands of people were following him as he was talking. We think about as he was reading the Bible, as we'd say, the Word of God. But he wasn't reading the Bible. Jesus was the very Word of God. They, the crowd, was hearing God. The presence of God. They were hearing Jesus speak God's Word. You talk about powerful you talk about the greatest communicator. You talk about he could pick out anything because he was speaking with the mind of God. Whatever he said was truth. Whatever he said was pure. What somebody would see, the Holy Spirit would communicate, and he had the power to communicate the very words of God. He was speaking truth. The attribute of God, the very word of God, was what Jesus was speaking when you see what he was saying, grounded the following, people picking up throughout the village, throughout the city, were just listening to whatever he would say. Not just human words, but the very word of God was being spoken through Jesus. John chapter 5, verse 24 says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. It is the very word of God that transforms people's lives. You cannot give your life to Christ until you hear the very word of God that's going to transform your life. It is a very important thing to hear God's word, the truth that is established. The first attribute was truth. The second is divine knowledge. He knew everything. God knows everything. God is not scared of tomorrow. And God is not worried about your yesterday. He has divine knowledge. Verse 4, when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and they were, and their nets were breaking. Divine knowledge. If you get the picture, Peter is a fisherman. Jesus is a carpenter. Jesus has tried to, for the last couple chapters, tried to draw Peter in to follow him. To, will you follow me? And, and he, was, he was following him from a distance. He was maybe a part-time follower. He knew about Jesus, but he was not a follower of Jesus. He was sitting outside of his boat, mending his net, he was out working all night. He caught nothing. He was tired. They were mending their fits, but they saw Jesus. So they sat and they said, you know what? Uh, let's just hang out and listen to what he has to say. But man, they've been working all night. And Jesus walks up to him. He gets into the boat and he starts sharing. And he says, guys, cast out your net. Peter, master, listen, dude. I don't know what you think you know, but I'm a fisherman. I've worked this lake for years. Fish are not biting at 11 o'clock in the morning after we've been out all night. There are no fish here. But I want to prove that to you. If that's what you want me to do, I will do it. Jesus knew where the fish were. Have you ever, how many of you guys like fishing? You know what? I hate fishing. I like catching fish. But I hate fishing, right? I mean, if you go fishing with me, you're going to sit out in that boat all night long, and you're not going to catch one thing. I'm a jinx on the water. Now, if you could promise me you're going to go out and you're going to catch fish, I love catching fish. I just don't like fishing. Somebody give me an amen to that one. All right. So Jesus, he likes 
catching fish. He knew exactly where the fish were. He had divine knowledge of where the fish are. When we talk about divine knowledge, he knew exactly what was going on. He knows everything. He knows when a sparrow falls to the ground. He can count the number of the hair on your head. He has not too much to worry about with me. A lot of you, he has a lot to worry about. He knows every detail. He knows where the fish are. When you say all knowledgeable, in the simple little scripture, he has truth. He has divine knowledge. I like what it says in Psalms chapter 139. Divine knowledge. This is a phenomenal chapter. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my settings down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. Are you acquainted with all of my ways? For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before. You've laid out your hand upon me. Such knowledge is wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain you. He knows all. He's all knowledgeable. And then you see the third attribute of God. He's all powerful. He's all powerful. Verse 7. So they signaled to their partners to the other boat to come out and help. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down on Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were there were astonished at the catch that they had taken. All powerful. Not only did Jesus know where the fish were, he developed the fish, though they jumped into the boat, they got into the nets so much that the, the, the boat began to sink. They fished all night. There's no way that many fish were right there, right off the shore. But when Jesus was there, they became exactly where they needed to be. The enormous amount of fish could only be given to them by God. When we have toiled, we have worked, and our life seems like it's falling apart, we have to understand that God is all-powerful. God can do anything at any time for anyone. See, what's neat about this is on the shore, there were thousands of people on the shore. Jesus was talking. The Word of God was speaking. Thousands of people were listening to him. He was so pressed against the water that he would have to go into the water. And he looked over at Simon. And he said, Simon, I need your boat. Out of 1,000, 2,000, or 3,000 people, the very God-man said, I need you. I need you. How awesome would that you, how awesome would you feel if you're in a crowded, crowded environment and the most important person in the room said, I need you. He said, okay, Lord. He got into his boat, cast off a little bit from the shore. He could have chosen anybody. But he chose the most influential person on the seashore other than Jesus to cast out into the deep. Because Jesus had, Peter had influence over the other fishermen. Jesus chose Peter. Not everybody got to get in the dip boat. But when Jesus asked Peter and the waters became full of fish, it was all powerful. Jesus can command the storms to cease, the waves to come, the fish to come in. He can command whatever he wants to command. We worry about our little feeble problem. But we have to remember, God has all power, just like Jesus has all power. And then, the attribute of holiness. Holiness. Listen to what it says in verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he saw the fish. He fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am sinful man, O Lord. Before Peter could do what Jesus wanted Peter to do, he had to get to the point of realizing that he was a sinner and that Jesus is the only way to help. When Peter saw that Jesus was God, 
when he realized that he had the attributes of God, he realized he was holy. Jesus always wants us to see our sinfulness so we can experience his salvation. Sometimes we have to realize that Jesus wants us to realize that we are a sinner so we can have salvation. Until we realize that I am in need of salvation, we'll never give our life to Christ. I love what the last attribute of God is. It's mercy. Verse 10. And so also were James and John and the sons of Zebedee who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. For then they had brought their boats to the land and forsook all and followed him. I've got a job to do. I want to expend my mercy, my love to everyone. You are going to be my church. You are going to do something great so you can have the calling of mercy upon your life. One of the attributes of God is mercy. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his calling upon our life. When you look at those attributes, we think about where we have been. And we have to say, God, I, I thank you. But why am I here? Because everything that I've done led me to where I am. The decisions I have made, the people I have met, the actions I performed have put me in my situation where I am right now. Good and bad, positive and negative, have put me where I am right now. So if I could ask this congregation, where are you right now? Because of what you've done, because of where you've come from, what can I do right now? And I want to parallel your life with Peter's life and see why, why did Peter have the privilege of standing with Jesus in a boat, getting deeper and having the greatest relationship of his life? It is because he first responded to God's call. You have to respond to God's call. Jesus tried to respond, and Jesus tried to get him to follow him two or three times before. The chapter before, uh, Jesus even healed his mother-in-law. You know, either that's going to make him respond or make him flee. I don't know, but he, he, Jesus healed his mother-in-law. So Jesus and Peter had this relationship. And when it came to pass that he was, people were pressed upon him to hear the very word of God, he stood at the lakeside, and he saw two ships standing at the lake, and their fishermen were gone out of them, and were washing their nets, and he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and asked him would he thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, launch out to the deep to let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night, and we have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down your nets. At thy word. Whatever we are doing for our occupation is not what God wants us to do for our spiritual relationship. He wants us to use what we do. He has a bigger purpose than why and what we do to make money. He has a bigger purpose than what we spend our vocation in. What he wants us to spend our vocation in is to make money to honor God and to take care of your family and to feed and to do the things of God. But what he wants, he wants us to use our vocation to share the love of Jesus to feed people. He wants us to use what God has called us. So the responding of God's call, when Peter said, yes, it changed his life. If you've given your life to Christ, you've responded to that call. It changed your life. The most important thing that you could ever do upon your life is to respond to the call of Jesus. And until we respond to the call of Jesus, we will never have complete, complete satisfaction. We'll never understand what God would want to do for us. The crowd was pressing in. The crowd was enormous. But even in the enormity of the crowd, Jesus looked at Peter. And he said, I 
need you. And when we have life going on, we have junk going on in all of our areas of our life, and we say, I don't know where God is. I really have all this junk going on, and I really have no idea what to do. We have to remember that even in the crowded times of our life, Jesus knows you. He wants to take care of you, and he wants to help you. Jesus is never too busy to meet you. Jesus is never too busy with the crowded areas of life, with the masses of people. Jesus is never too busy to meet your deepest need. Did he change you? Has he worked with you? When we respond to that call, just as Peter responded to the call and said yes, what Jesus did for him is where most parts of our Christianity stop. We've responded to the call. We know that we have our fire insurance, if you would. We know that we're going to heaven. We know that because of what Jesus has done for me, and I've responded to that call, I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven. And Jesus loves us. But this is what he wants for us. Luke 5, 3. And he entered into the ship, which was Simon's. And he asked him if they would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. When Jesus meets us, he wants us to take us from just the shallowness of our faith to the deepness of our faith. He doesn't want us to be satisfied with church on Sunday morning. He doesn't want to be satisfied with just praying and reading the Bible. He wants us to be deep within him, within his life. What happened to Simon changed his life. The deepness became the necessity of Peter's life. He, Peter would never be able to do the great things that Peter did throughout the Word of God if he didn't volunteer to go deeper with God. Sometimes we're satisfied with the shallow end. God wants us to go to the deep end. And how do we go to the deep end? Sometimes the deep end requires commitment. Sometimes the deep end requires study. Sometimes it desires faith. Sometimes it's not what somebody else says, it's what God says. Sometimes we can't just rely on somebody else preaching. Sometimes we have to study even if we don't preach. Sometimes we have to take the deeper things of God, the things that he wants for our lives. When Jesus was teaching the multitudes, he was teaching a single individual something bigger and better than what the multitudes were hearing. The multitudes were hearing God's word. What Peter got was God's heart. I want something for you. And when we get to the point that we launch a little deeper with God, we get to hear the very heart of God. I want something for you. I don't want to just teach you the very words of God. I don't want you to have the knowledge of God. I want you to have the heart of God. From that time on, the shallowness of Peter's heart Oh, he was ignorant, and sometimes he did some stupid things, but he knew God's heart. Simon protested mildly. He said, he said, Master, I've been doing this for a long time. I really don't know if I want to do that or not. Sometimes when God is touching your heart, the Holy Spirit is asking you to do something, we have all kinds of protests. Ah, that's not for me. I'm too busy. They won't like me. I don't have enough resources. We can mildly protest anything that God has asked us to do. And you know what? He is ready for our protests. He's never going to make us do what he's asked us to do. It's an invitation for us to do great things for him. Even Peter mildly protested. He said, dude, you don't know what you're talking about. I am the fisherman. You are a carpenter. You go make a bench while I fish our food. And Jesus looked at him and goes, cast out a little deeper. And it proved to him at that moment 
who Jesus truly was. And sometimes when Jesus has asked us to launch out into the deep in the uncertainty of life, we have no idea where we're going to go. We have no idea what we're going to do. But what it does, it changes our destiny. Many of us, many of you, have made commitments to God. Made commitments to God for all kinds of different things. We launched out to the deep. But when the deep got rough, we paddled back to the shore. So, nah, I don't know if I want to do that one or not. I know I love Jesus, but I don't know if I want to do that. And sometimes we, through our depth that Jesus wants us to go sometimes, our fear of the depth takes over. And out of fear, we say, I really don't want to do that. I really can't do that. So we give up the commitment that we have had for Christ. We haven't given up our salvation because our salvation is in Christ. But a commitment that you've made, a decision that you have made. I've gone to so many summer camps, so many adult camps and winter camps, and people gave their life to Christ and said they want to be faithful in the ministry or they want to do certain things or they have made a commitment to go into full-time ministry. And, you know, a lot of things have happened within their life, and, and they just say, you know what? I, I think that was an emotional response. I don't think that's really what God wanted for me to do. And you know what happened? They launched out to the deep. And they realized that the deep was not what God, the, what, the deep was not really what they wanted, even though it was what God may have wanted. And they have dog paddled back to the shore. Their commitment, oh, they love Jesus, but they're not ready for that depth. So they start doubting. So what happens to the third thing? By embracing uncertainty, by embracing uncertainty, God can draw us closer to him. Deep water is tough. Embracing uncertainty, what does that mean? That means God is not going to make our life easy. Just because we gave our life to Christ doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Matter of fact, when we give our life to Christ, it's going to become difficult. We are going to launch out into the deep in certain areas, and we have to embrace the uncertainty of life. Sometimes we, me included, we feel like, well, as long as it's easy, as long as everything's going to be comfortable, as long as everybody likes me, as long as everything is going to be okay, I will do whatever God wants me to do. But as soon as we get in that boat and we launch out into that deep and those waves start coming and people start yelling at us and we get scared, so what we do is we stop going deep. So we start getting back to the shore. We need to embrace verses 4 and 5. Now when he had left speaking, he held, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered and said, Master, we have toiled all night. We have taken nothing. Nevertheless, thy word, I will let down my nets. Jesus turns what we're concerned about to what he is concerned for. He, Peter, was concerned, I've done this all night. We haven't caught anything. And whenever we lift up our opposition to God, he wants our opposition. He can handle our opposition. He is not intimidated by your questions. He wants to take your questions and your opposition. He wants you to talk to him. He wants you to allow him to voice your pain, to your hurt, even your anger to God. Peter said, I've done this all night. He said, let me show you. Just listen to me. Cast them. The awness. Is that a word? The awness? The awesomeness of God. Just cast it on the other side. Just cast it on the other side. Your uncertainty will become certain if you trust in me. What you cannot do, I can do. What you are afraid to do, I can do. There's a phrase that we say, I'm in deep water. Okay? What you're truly saying is, I'm in big trouble. I'm in deep water. It means I, if, I, if I get out of this boat, I'm going to sink over my head. I'm in deep water. And if somebody tells you you're in deep water, what are they saying? I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. We can come to somebody's trouble. We can come to their rescue. We can help them out. We can help them for a day. We can help them for a month. We can help them for a while. But what every person needs that's in deep trouble spiritually is they need a touch 
of God. They need God to come into their life and to rescue them and to help them. Whether you're a fisherman, whether you work at an at a aircraft industry, whether you're a fireman or whether you're a cop, whether you're a preacher, you're going to have junk take place in your life. You're going to have problems from your past that's going to hinder your future. And what we have to do is we have to make markers and say, I understand my troubles and I need Jesus. I don't just want him. I don't want to just hear him in the crowd. I want Jesus to come into my life. I want him to launch me into the deep. And I need him to protect me. Because I guarantee you the closest protection I can have is when I have God and he's the only person that can rescue me. As long as I have 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 other people, I'll be all right. But when I have God and I'm in deep water, I'm in trouble, that's when I can fall on my face before God. That's when I can say I need him. But we have doubts. We have fears. We have uncertainties. One of the biggest doubts that we could think of was the doubting Thomas. One of his disciples. They named me after him. Jesus was in the upper room and Thomas was gone. For the first time, Jesus came in and talked to his disciples. And they saw his scars. And they said, Thomas, you, you just missed it. Jesus was right here. And Thomas said this, I will not believe unless I can see for myself the scars in his hand and the piercing in his side. A few days later, Jesus appears in the upper room with Thomas being there. Jesus looks right at him. And he said, Thomas, I am here. Take your fingers and put them through my side. Look at the nail prints on my hand. Thomas said, oh Lord, my God. And then Jesus said something to him. He said, blessed are you, for you have seen me. But more blessed are those that have faith that have not seen me. Sometimes we have doubts. We have fears. But what Jesus says is, trust me. In your doubts, in your fears, go to the very Word of God. Doubting questions from doubting people. The difference between you and Thomas is this. You have the Holy Spirit to guide you, to teach you, and to complete you. You have the very Word of God that you can open up the words of God and believe the truth of the very Word of God. The attribute of God is truth. And Jesus became, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is truth. We can take the very words of God, look at what God is doing, take the Holy Spirit of God. So when we have our doubts and we have our fears, we have God. What we need more than anything in this entire world is we have to realize where I've come from is a catalyst a realization to fall on our knees before God and say, I need you. I can't do this on my own. I can't live my life on my own. I can't be happy on my own. Oh, I can exist. I can, I can take care of myself. But if I want true joy, if I want true happiness, if I want a relationship that's built on rock of Jesus Christ, I need to trust in him. If we have never given our life to Christ, if we've never invited Jesus into our life, we will never have the complete satisfaction and joy that you need to have. Now, salvation and joy is not what Jesus died for. That's an attribute of what we get. Let me tell you what Jesus Christ came to this world to do. He came to this world to die for you. Not to make you happy. Not to make you rich. To save you. There's not one person in this room... There's not one person in this world that can get to heaven without first going through Jesus. You can't. We can look at all kinds of denominations and say, all you can do is be good. All you do is go to church. If you give a little bit of money, you're going to be good, and you're out. good will outweigh your bad, and you're going to go to heaven. But the Bible says no one can come into the Father but by me. We must invite Jesus into our life. 
And if we have never invited Jesus into our life, I'm telling you the greatest decision that you can make is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and allow him to change your life today. Now the tra- question for the, for the believers. You would say amen to that one. Absolutely. Everybody needs Jesus. Everybody needs to go to heaven. Everybody needs to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I've done that. I've done that 30 years ago. And they need to do that or they will never have heaven. And that is absolutely true. You know what the worst thing about a Christian is? They stay a baby Christian for the rest of their life. There are so many baby Christians because they're afraid to get into the boat and they're afraid God to launch out into the deep so they stay babes for a long, long time. I want to challenge the Christians. I agree. Everybody needs to become a Christian. Amen. But our churches are full of baby Christians that need to get into the boat and launch out into the deep and let God do a great work within your life. If we had a boat full of Christians that are willing to go deeper into the water, God can do great and miraculous things in our life if we get out of being baby Christians. Going to church on Sunday, saying amen to a sermon, singing two songs, putting our time in. Go into the deep water. See what God can do within your life. You have troubles? Yeah. You're going to have trouble so God can work your troubles out. God can do great things within your life. Let us on purpose launch out into the deep. Can I trust God? Can I? I know I can. But do I? Do I trust him? I trust him on Sundays. I trust him for some things. I don't understand him. I, I wish I had a full grasp of what he's doing within my life. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. God is so much more powerful, wiser, more knowledgeable than I could ever comprehend. What I must do, just like Simon Peter, what is it, Lord, that you need from me? Oh, I just need your life. And I need you to get off the shore. I need you to launch out into the deep. I need you to do something you can't do on your own. I need you to do something that if you capsize, you need me. And you know what? I'm going to capsize you. Because I want you to need me. Because once you need me, you're going to worship me. Once you need me, you'll understand that I'm there for you. Once you need me, you'll never let go of me. Once you need me, you know that I will be there every step of the way. You have no problem worshiping me. I want you to launch out into the deep so you can't do it on your own. I want you to do something so great and so grand that when somebody says, how did you do that? You say, I have no idea. God did it. And when God does it, you can worship him. You can glorify my name. Because we always go back to that same scripture. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and we allow God to launch us into the deep, we love him. We can go back to the scripture in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Two things right there. Love God as I accept him into my life. I love him more than anything else. And then launch out into the deep is do what I've called you to do. All things. Wherever you go, whatever you do as a child of God, you can love God because you trust in him. And all things will work out because you are launching out into the deep. You, you may not know what's taking place. You may not know why you have to move to Kansas City. You may not know what the next job is. You may not know why you have no money in the bank. You may not know every circumstance. But you know, I am going to launch out into the deep no matter what. And God, God is going to come alongside you. Oh, the waves may be vicious. The boat may capsize. You may say, what in the world do I do? How do I even get out of this? And you know where he wants us to go? The same place 
Simon Peter went when he realized how great God was. He fell on his knees before God. And he said, I am a sinner. I shouldn't even be in your presence. That's when Peter's life changed. Have you been there? Have you given your life to Christ? Have you realized in your life that you can't do it on your own? You can't get to God on your own, and you're a sinner, and you will not ever stop sinning? What do you need? You need Jesus. And I'm sure there are some of you that have never accepted Jesus as your Lord. But I am determined to tell you that there are plenty of Christians that were just like Peter, sitting on the shore, mending their nets, content to listen to Jesus, but not willing to do what Jesus asked them to do. We need, we need a body of believers that will get into the boat, cast out a little deeper, and to see what God will do. Have you given your life to Christ? Are you willing to let Christ take over your life? You know, when you're talking about Christianity, it's talking about humility. It's talking about the lack of pride and allowing God to take over our life. One of the hardest things that we will ever do is accept where God wants us to go. When we're talking about our faith, what we must do is allow God to take over every area of our life and allow God to work in our life.